السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته. We thank Allah subhanahu wa taala for this opportunity and this tawfiq that He has given us, and we pray to Allah subhanahu wa taala that He continues to give us the wisdom and the strength to be able to fulfill not just our own vision, but in fact the mission and the vision of the twelfth Imam. Alhamdulillah, over the last couple of decades, we have seen immense growth within the Muslim community. What I want to do this evening is to talk about how we have grown, what is the approach that we have taken, and what is the approach that we should be taking. Now, I know that there are many youths sitting in the audience today. And some of the youth may be wondering why I address them with this topic. It's going to be a little bit academic as well. But I want the youth to remember that I, we don't see you for what you are today. We see you for what you are going to be tomorrow. You're going to be the leaders of the community. You're going to be leading our communities. And what is the approach that you're going to be taking? And what is the mindset that you're going to be having? Alhamdulillah, our elders and people in our generation, they put a lot of effort to bring us where we are today. They made a lot of sacrifices to bring us where we are today. But now we must think about the next phase of our growth, the next part of our evolution. And what is the mindset that we need for the next phase of our growth? One of the things you must have noticed is that the Muslim community largely is a very reactionary community. We don't anticipate the challenges. We don't anticipate the opportunities. We wait for the challenges to come to us and then we react to it. And we say, what are we supposed to do over here? <clears throat> For example, we recognize that now that we're beginning to settle in this part of the world, we're going to be needing our own centers. So we built small centers. And then as we grew, we realized the centers were very small. Then we say, now let's build a bigger center. I remember when we had built the Azahra Center, back in 2012, or sorry, 2002. And many people at that time asked, do we actually need a center of this size? <clears throat> Isn't it not going to be used? Our community is not so big, right? And you see that we were only thinking about what we need in 2000 or 2002. We did not even anticipate 10 years down the road, what is the community going to look like? The population of Vancouver is growing. What are the needs of the community going to be 10 years down the road? Right? So largely we are a very reactionary community. When we realize that we're running out of places to bury, then we think of buying a cemetery. And by the time we decide to do that, sometimes the places are far away, for example, right? When we notice that the ministry is putting out a new curriculum and it's already entered the school and they're talking about not only teaching children but actually indoctrinating them with certain values about orientation and gender identity then we react and we say what are we supposed to do as a Muslim community? Didn't we anticipate 10 years ago that this was coming? Shouldn't we have anticipated 10 years ago that this is along the ways, right? You know, this is not the first time that Muslims have come to North America. As I've mentioned to some of you, the early Muslims came in the 17th and the 18th century. And they came as slaves from North Africa and West Africa. There were 150,000 in number as Muslims 
in that period of time. Okay? And as many of you know, not only were they Muslims, but they were practicing Muslims. The slaves used to ask their masters for time for Salat. They used to establish Jum'ah ah as well. They used to have ulama amongst them as well. They wrote tafasir in North America back then and they were written in the Arabic language as well. And slowly they started to integrate into society. And generations came about the way we're going through our phases as well. You know, there was a time where they thought of themselves as African slaves who are living in America. And then their children thought of them as sales as Americans living in America. And you see, we're going through the same growth as well. And there was a time when we first immigrated over here, and we said we're only here for a short period of time, and then we're going back to Africa. We're going back to India. We're going back to Iraq. And then we went back, and we say, this is not a place where we can live. And then we say, no, now we're Indians, we're Arabs, we're Afghanis, that happen to be living in Canada, and we're going to live over here. And now when you look at our children, they think of themselves as Canadians living in Canada. Now we should anticipate what are some of the challenges they're going to face and what are some of the opportunities that they're going to have. Okay? And we can look at the challenges that the previous Muslims faced. You know, there was a <coughs> Hafiz of the Qur'an in the 19th century. He was brought as a slave from West Africa to America. And he was very knowledgeable about Islam and very knowledgeable about the Qur'an. And he lived for a few years in slavery. And he became acclimatized to the environment in America. So now he writes, and it's very interesting. And I'm going to read it for you verbatim <coughs> as to what happened. Okay? He says, my parents' religion is of the Musalman. I'm sorry, I'm just reading it verbatim to give you an idea of the thought process at that time. They are all circumcised, and their devotions are five times a day. They fast in the month of Ramadan. They give tribute according to their laws. They fight for their religion. They struggle for their religion. And they travel to Hijaz, those who are capable for the Hajj. They don't eat any meat except what they, kill, what them, what they themselves kill. They do not drink wine nor spirits as it is an abomination to do so. They do not associate with any that worships idols, nor profane the Lord's name, nor do they dishonor their parents, or commit murder, or bear false witness, or who are covetous, proud, or boastful. For such faults are an abomination unto my religion. Now listen carefully. Now listen carefully. They are particularly careful in the education of their children and in their behavior. But I am lost to all of these advantages. Since my bondage, I am corrupt. And I now conclude by begging the Almighty God to lead me into the faith that is proper for me. For He alone knows the secrets of my heart and what I am in need of. Abu Bakr Siddiq, Kingston, Jamaica. 1834. Right. We should anticipate the challenges that we're going to face. And the question we should be asking is, how are we going to overcome those challenges? And what institutions do we need to build to be able to overcome those challenges? In fact, sometimes you notice that we lack a vision as a community. If I were to ask you as Shia Muslims, what is your vision for the Shia community in 20 or 30 years in Vancouver? The reason we lack a vision is that our mindset is the mindset of survival, whereas our mindset should be a mindset of growth. Okay? We ask, what do we need for our survival? 
when we should always as Muslims be asking what do we need for the growth of Islam and the Muslim community? I tell you, the Prophet of God in places where we would be worried about survival, the Prophet of God was thinking of growth, he was thinking of a vision, and not just a small vision, but a very large vision. In the Battle of Ahzab, it was such a most difficult battle. 10,000 had surrounded the Muslims and they had sworn that they were going to end Islam once and for all. There was nothing to eat in the camp of the Holy Prophet. In the Battle of Ahzab, the Prophet of Allah took a stone and tied it to his stomach. Yeah? That's how hard it was. And the Muslims were not sure if they're going to see tomorrow or they're not going to see tomorrow. Yeah? And we're told that as they were digging the ditch, the trench, there was a stone that they could not break and they needed to break it so that there would be a trench over there. And that Prophet took the axe himself and he struck hard and as he struck hard there were sparks. And the Prophet said, Allahu Akbar in the Battle of Ahzab. And then he struck hard again and there were more sparks and the stone broke a little bit more. And the Prophet said, Allahu Akbar. And then he struck the third time and finally broke the stone. And again he said, Allahu Akbar. And the Muslims came to him. And they said, Ya Rasulullah. You said, Allahu Akbar three times. Why did you say that? Now listen to the Prophet. Where we think of survival, the Prophet is thinking of growth. Yeah? The Prophet said, the first time I stuck the stone and there were sparks, Jibra'il said to me, you will conquer Rome. I said, Allahu Akbar. And the second time he said, you will conquer Persia. And I said, Allahu Akbar. And the third time he said, you will conquer Yemen. And I said, Allahu Akbar. And the Prophet believed at that time that this is going to be the growth of the Muslim community. You know, there's a beautiful hadith from the first Imam where he tells us that growth is necessary for survival. You either grow or you lead towards death. He says, and you've heard this hadith, that if your day today is the same as yesterday, then you have been deceived, you've been cheated, you've made a loss. Because every day is supposed to be better than yesterday. And if today is worse than yesterday, then then death is better for this person. Why? Because if you're not growing, then you are going towards death. Now I ask you, is that only true of individuals? Or is that also true of communities as well? That as a community, we always have to be growing. We're not just waiting for challenges to come our way, and then we say, what are we going to do about this? We say, we anticipate this challenge, we anticipate this opportunity, we're constantly growing towards it. It's very important for us to do that. Okay? In fact, you know, we need to think about not just our growth, but the growth of Islam, the growth of good values, the growth of the mission of the 12th Imam in this land. Let me ask you that today <clears throat> we have come to Canada and we're present over here. Are we present here by chance and coincidence? Do we have a greater purpose living in this part of the world? Or do we only work here and study over here and hope inshallah that we also maintain our Iman and that's it? Allah has a plan for everything. So what is His plan for us being over here? Yeah? You know, one day a companion came to the sixth Imam, Hamad al Sanadi or Al Sindi. And he said that, I say to Imam al Sadiq, alayhi afdal al salati wa salam. Look at that vision, look at the mindset the Imam is trying to impart to us. You know, what does it mean to be a Muslim? Is it only prayers and fasting? Or is a Muslim defined by his mindset, by his thoughts? Hmm? 
He says to the Imam that I sometimes travel to the lands of Kufr, where non-Muslims are more, where Muslims are very few. Okay? And some of our companions, they tell me that if you were to die in those lands, then on the day of judgment, you're going to be raised with them. You will be raised amongst the kuffar. So should I travel to those lands? Or should I not travel to those lands? There's a whole discussion over here, and what I'm going to give you is only a part of that discussion. Okay? Living in non-Muslim countries. Now the Imam says to him, this is the condition for living outside of Muslim lands. The Imam says to him, if you go over there and you share the haqq, you share the right path with them, you share our teachings with them, you share the teachings of Islam with them, and then you die over there, then on the day of judgment you will be raised as an ummah by yourself. And your light will be in front of you. But with that condition, right? Now, is that the plan that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has for us? Okay. Now let me ask you, when I and you think of the future of the Muslim community and the Shia community in Vancouver, what does that future look like? 20 years, 30 years down the road. Hmm? Today, I count we have about eight communities or eight centers. Two in Richmond, I think four in Surrey, one in North Vancouver, and one in Burnaby, eight. After 30 years, what is growth? Is it to go from eight centers to 16? Is it to go from a few thousand people to 10,000 people? What do you anticipate can be the growth and the opportunity for the Shia community in Vancouver? Yeah? Or is it that we can say in 20 or 30 years, Vancouver can become an important hub for the Shia community? Vancouver can be an important place for the Shia community. That not only are we going to be a part of our society, but we're going to be contributing to our society. Not only are we going to be a part of our society, but you know, until today, we are consumers of knowledge, we are consumers of idea. 20 or 30 years down the road, we will be the producers of those ideas. We will be influencing our societies. We will be leading them, not just in running communities, we will be leading them in thought and ideas. The thinkers will come from us. The revolutionaries will come from us. The leaders, not just for the Shia community, the leaders for the society will come from us. And my question to you is, if that's the vision, then what do we need to do to get to that vision? Right? <clears throat> How do we achieve that vision? And I think one important thing that we have to be able to do is to build our own institutions and to strengthen the institutions that we already have. It's very important for us to have our own schools, our own elementary schools, our own high schools. It's very important for us to strengthen our madrasas. It's very important for us to strengthen our youth groups. It's very important to have our own pre-houses where people come from Vancouver and slowly make their ways to Qum and Najaf and they come back to Vancouver as thinkers, as people who are going to lead the community. What I want to focus on tonight is the importance of having our own institutions of learning, schools, madrasas, pre-seminaries, for example. Right? When you think of a school, what do you think of a school as? Is it just a place of education? 
Is it just a place of learning? It's very interesting, one of the thinkers out there who's not even a Muslim thinker is Noam Chomsky. Sociologist, political analyst, you know, philosopher as well to some extent. And he says, what do you think is the role of schools in a capitalist system? We live in a capitalist system. Do you think the role of a school in a capitalist system is to produce a thinker? To produce a revolutionary? To produce a leader? To produce somebody who will think outside of a box? To produce a philosopher and a deep thinker? Not at all. The purpose of schools, the way they are run today in a capitalist system, is to produce skilled workers to support the capitalist system so that the capitalist system continues to go the way it's going. Isn't that the case? You're taught a particular skill. You're rewarded for learning that skill. You're taught a particular path. And you're told, go down this path. And at the end of it, there's a house. At the end of it, there's a car. At the end of it, there's a vacation. And we'll even give you the loans that you need to be able to go through this system. Is that what we want for our children? Now imagine, if we had our own school, where we raised children, not only to think about God, but to make God a part of their lives. Not only to believe in the hereafter, but to make the hereafter a part of their lives. To be bold, to be courageous, to be strong, to be independent thinkers, to be people who are going to bring about revolutions, to be people who are going to encourage good and discourage that which is wrong. What do you think the Shia community looks like 20, 30 years down the road? Well, that's the only way to influence society. That's the only way to come out of that system where you're only users of what the society is producing and to become somebody who be influences what society is doing, influences thought in society. If first and foremost we believe in our own independence, we believe that the best teachings come from the Qur'an, the best teachings come from the teaching of the Ahlul Bayt salam, and we impart that to our children. And then they become independent thinkers and leaders in society. I've taken up quite a bit of your time today. I don't want to end up taking more time. But brothers and sisters, we've got to have that vision and we've got to have that belief as well to go with it. This mindset that says we cannot do it is not the mindset of a Muslim. A Muslim, first and foremost, is defined by his mindset. Yeah? We've got to believe that anything we do with tawfiq from Allah, we can do it. We can be successful at it. We can be the best at it. We can become leaders at it as well. And a few years ago, people doubted if we could run our own elementary schools. They say, if you run your own schools, they're still not going to be as good as the public schools, right? They're going to struggle, they're going to suffer. And we have a successful model here in Vancouver of running an elementary school. Look at the Azahra Islamic Academy today. Alhamdulillah, we have around 170, 180 students. Now we have a waiting list when it comes to grade 1, 2, and 3. Perhaps some of you may be thinking, why do we need another school in the Surrey area? Well, Az-Zahra has almost reached its capacity. There is no more room now at Az-Zahra. Yeah. Are we good <clears throat> as a school? Well, last year, when they actually had the testing done, out of 900 something, close to a thousand schools in BC, Azahra was ranked amongst the top 10% of schools in British Columbia. What about the akhlaq of the students, the iman of the students? 
You know, I tell you that whenever our students at the Azhar Islamic Academy go and play soccer or they integrate with other students from other schools, be they Christian or from the Ahl Sunnah or the Jewish community, one of the comments we always get is, how do your students have such good akhlaq? Right? We get that all the time. So, a few years ago, we were doubting whether we can have a successful elementary school or not. Alhamdulillah, we have a model here in Vancouver. Then we said, we can have our own high schools. And again, the same question, the same mindset. Can we do it? Can we be successful at it? Well, subhanallah, look at Toronto. They have two successful examples. One is As-Sadiq, the second is Waliul Asr. But wait, can the level of education be good? It's very interesting. You know when you go to the University of Toronto, if I were to ask you, the youngest person to graduate from the University of Toronto, what is the age of that person? What would you say? Graduating from a university. You know, you normally graduate from high school at the age of 18. You do at least four years of university. The earliest you can graduate is what? At the age of 22. 22. Okay. What's the youngest a person at the University of Toronto has graduated? Sorry? 21. Ah. 17. It happened last year. Her name is Sakina Rizwi, and she graduated from the Valiul Asr School. And CTV did an interview with her. You can find it online. And she credited her growth, her academic growth, to her high school from which she graduated. Now if I stand in front of you today and say, Inshallah, in 30 years down the road, we want to have our own colleges, our own universities then we shouldn't have the same mindset and say, but can we really do it? That's not the mindset of a Muslim, right? Inshallah, we hope that 30, 40 years down the road, we will have our own institutions, our own elementary schools, our own high schools, our own colleges, our own growing, expanding madrasas, strong youth groups, right? strong youth centers like the ones that al Kawthar is building and we're going to be supporting that inshallah as a community right? to have our own seminaries pre-seminaries where we study here we go to Qum, we go to Najaf, we come back and serve our communities and we create the thinkers of tomorrow and I hope inshallah that the step that we have taken today in this community and other communities in what is one step closer, not only towards fulfilling that vision, but fulfilling the vision and the mission that the 12th Imam has for us in the lower uh, mainland area. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.